Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us on a lovely evening like this. I'm Shannon, marketing executive for Allen Photo. Before I hand over the time to Matthias, let me share with everyone more about Matthias. Matthias Heng is an international photojournalist who spends much of his time on photo, photographic assignments in, to name some, Afghanistan, Austria, Bangladesh, Egypt, India, Iraq, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Mongolia, Nepal, Philippines, and many more. Yeah. So he's also a Leica camera ambassador. Much of his work focusing on the documentary narrative of conflicts, natural disasters, poverty, social issues, and its effects on, it, on the civilian population. His work appeared internationally in a range of publications for both NGOs and editorial organizations throughout Asia and Europe. Despite exposure to many atrocities, Matthias has never lost his passion and commitment to humanity. He continues to capture images which speaks to people around the globe. Matthias is also a user of the Leica M system for over 30 years. Prior to using Leica, he was using uh, Canon and Hasselblad in the fashion industry. What you're about to see in his sharing and are various films and digital images taken with the Leica M9 and M240 and a few others, which he will, he will share with you guys in a bit. During this session, if you have any questions, please feel free to share with us in the chat box. Matthias, please. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, good evening, everybody in Asia, and uh, good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, today, I'm going to share with you about uh, my journey and my life as a photojournalist, and um, of course, the camera that I use, how I get my images. So, I'm, I'm going to talk about my thoughts and how I get my photos and uh, how one can maximize your, your equipment, uh, you know, so, so how you can get the best photo out of it. So I will show you my um, first picture. This, is, um, this was taken in Pakistan. Uh, this was during the 9-11 uh, um, crisis. So I was going to the arms market. And how I got this photo, um, I was the only tourist there. And uh, of course, my guide, the Pashtun guy, took me. So we had lunch and um, I get stares from all these people behind, rather in front. And... I didn't take a picture. So what caught my eye was um, these guys looking at me and that guy. And of course this man, I took about four frames, but you know, he made the photo for me because he turned his head sideways. So I took a picture of it. Then of course, you know, um, knowing your, your camera is, is very important is how you, you exposed it. Under this lighting is quite a difficult light. So um, as you can see here, it's pretty smoky. And above me, there was pretty bright light. So what I did, I blocked that light to get my shades. So that's, what, that's how I got my photos. And um, so this was on the way to, um, to the arms market. This was taken in um, in Mozambique. I was um, assigned uh, to take photos of the uh, the NGOs. They were working with street children. Uh, again, um, it never caught my eye. I worked through observation, and and this photo, you know, they they were praying. They were praying, and 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 the boy in the middle uh, put his hand up. And I was like, wow, this is a photo. And just as I, I brought my camera and closed, and I saw three hands coming in my way. And a lot of people will, 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 will find that that is, is a, this, this, this distraction for them, you know, they spoil the photo. But to me, no, this, that's what makes a photo for me. So when you start taking pictures, things like that, elements fill your main subject. So that caught my eye and took a picture of that.
This was taken in uh, Japan during the year. Uh, I covered the tsunami and I did a book on it. I did a three year project. And six, after six months, I went back to Japan and this was uh, in Casanova. And what really caught my eye was the motorcyclist. He was the postman. He was doing his round, doing his, uh, his job, post, uh, delivering meals. So, um, so again, uh, how do I see it? How do I see things uh, that, that make a picture? Um, I always like to put people in because with people in a photo, for me, it adds lives. It brings life to the picture. So how I look at photos, um, is this not taking a nice picture? Uh, uh, for me, it's, it's, uh, I want my picture to look like a movie in, in a sense that I, I want to feel emotions. Uh, I want to feel, you know, the, the um, compelling pictures that, that can relate to my viewer. So again, if, again if, if without this person, then it's just a fishing boat, a fishing vessel being pushed, you know, to shore. And, and everybody can take a picture of that and say, yeah, you know, but uh, it's, it's once you add people, you add life to your photo. Same. Um, this was like a week later after the tsunami, I went in. Um, this place was, the devastation was, um, was huge. You know? So um, I just didn't know how, I didn't know where to start um, to take a photo because, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's just overwhelming. You just don't know how to take a good picture because everything everything is is so so big and massive the 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 disaster and um so i had to sort of bring myself in compose uh when, I, when i'm saying in compose so when you take a picture yeah um you gotta be in compose within yourself in order to compose a picture if you know what i mean so you know a lot of us sometimes we get excited and we start taking, you know, getting inside and bring the camera and started taking pictures. Uh, but we are not in compose. We are not in, in control. So if you're not in control, sometimes that's when we do mistakes. So I had to sort of bring myself in the middle of my self and then look for what is good and what's, how to bring the strongest message to my audience. This was taken in um, Pakistan, in Kashmir, during the earthquake. Um, so when I was there, you know, the, the, the aid workers, they were throwing bags of flour. And I was below, I was like, wow. You know, uh, the truck, was, the truck is, is really high, is, 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 you know, in order to fill up bags of uh, flour. So when I was, Below where, where all these people were trying to catch hold the, the bags of flour. And I was thinking, I mean, that angle, you know, it doesn't show much. So I did, I had to climb. So I, I literally climbed uh, to the truck. And the truck is, is not a normal truck like what we have it here. The truck is huge and it's pretty high. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, the reason why this truck is so high is so that they can stack as, as many bags as they could to so maximize it. So, so I had to climb right to the top. Uh, and the truck was about, about two story high, the, the height of it. So I had to climb and you know, when they're throwing the bag and that's when I took a picture. So in order to take a photo like that, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, we get excited. Uh, we're just like, oh, okay, you know, whenever the back is going down or, or you see that moment, you start taking pictures all the time. But the thing is, you got to wait for the right moment. So again, um, the system I work with, I, um, you know, everybody uses different camera. I use the Leica and I use the M series. So I've been using this M series for 30 years. As Shannon was saying, before that I was using Hasselblad. 
uh, Canon, and I was also using a Nikon. I was a fashion and commercial photographer before I became a photojournalist. So um, the reason why I use this, um, uh, at that time I was doing a lot of documentary work and I could not achieve what I was looking in my photo. I could not get, uh, something was missing, the missing link in that photo. So, um, so I heard so much about this camera and um, I bought it and I tried it and it blew my mind. And of course, with the optics, you know, um, in a fast lens, this allows me to shoot under all lighting condition, be it whether it's in the bright area or in the dark area. Uh, this was the earthquake as well in uh, Kashmir. Um, I walked this place in Musafarabad so many times. Um, he didn't catch my eyes. So what caught my eye was this man. Yeah, he caught my eye. And this was shot, uh, like I said, I use uh, all the M range. So this was shot on film camera, it was shot on M6. So at that time, so, you know, when you shoot on film, you, you, you can't see it straight away. So, so when I took this photo, I didn't even know after I went back to process it, then I scan it. So when I scanned, I saw this man and I saw this sign saying he's believing. And that immediately hit me because, you know, of course, without this man is seeing is believing is still a strong picture. But again, uh, as I emphasize, without human element, uh, it's just a signage. So I want to bring the photo to life. So, you know, this, so this man really caught, make the photo for me. This was taken in um, Papua New Guinea. I did this, this assignment for a non-government organization and for the United Nation. On, a, on peace building in Mendy. So um, to go to Mendy, uh, you have to go to Port Mosby. From Port Mosby, you have to take another flight to Mendy. So as you can see, the background, that's a runway. So that's where we land. And, and from there, we go by road. So from Port Mosby, uh, you cannot go by road. So a lot of places in, uh, in New Guinea, uh, there's no road access. You need to fly first, then land, and then you go by road. So I stayed with this family. Uh, it would take us about eight, eight or ten hours to walk to the village. So they only go down to the city or town area uh, to buy sugar, salt, things like that. Uh, other than that, they're pretty uh, self-reliant. So they've got their own veggie, uh, veggie patch. So this assignment was to cover the tribal war, which was not in the mainstream media. So, you know, so Mandy was, uh, you know, they had their own tribal, tribal war. So the NGOs, they were the negotiators. They were trying to make peace between the two tribes. So I was there to, to, to do a documentary on it. And... Uh, yes. Uh, Patrick asked, uh, do you ever ever fear missing out on a picture or have you missed a moment? How do you overcome this in your photographic uh, journey? Yes, I, um, there are many times I, I, um, I missed out on a picture and I missed out on that moment. Uh, it's not because um, I'm slow or whatever. It's because sometimes uh, I'm at risk. Uh, so there are a lot of Photos are still in my mind. Uh, to me, it could be an award-winning photo, um, but I could not take the risk. Uh, typically, one example, when I was in Burma, I was, or now they call it Myanmar, I was covering on the chain gangs, the prisoners in chains. Um, and I took, I managed to take pictures of uh, prisoners at work and washing up. And, um, and there was this 
prison bus uh, was just coming along my way and it really caught my eye. You know, I was so tempted to bring my camera up and take a photo um, because uh, in the prison bus, uh, they had bars all over and, and all the prisoners, their faces were going like that. They were, you know, squashed like sardines, you know, uh, against the bar. And I was like, wow, this is the picture, man. You know, you would never see it. But I could not take a photo because uh, as, as I was doing that, about to lit, bring my camera up, uh, there were two military guys who were coming towards me. So, so I knew if I took the photo, I would have, I would have blown the, my whole assignment. So I had to let it go. So till today, it's still in my head. You know, I, I can visualize it clearly every day. You know, it plays on me every day. Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, um, yes, I do miss such such photos, which. Um, that's why pictures is, is, is so powerful. Uh, so for me, uh, photos tells a story and, and can change the world, can change things. Like this, this was shot in, uh, in South Africa. This was, uh, I did this for the Washington Post. Uh, I was in the prison. Um, and again, people ask me, how do I get this photo? So again, I, um, I don't talk when I, I take my photos. I don't talk to my, sub, my, my, my subject or to the people because I want to capture them as the way they are. I want to capture the essence of them. So all these photos you are seeing, they are not set up. They are not cropped. They are full frame. When I say full frame, I compose from the camera. So I was trained to, to, to compose from the camera. So I don't crop at all. So, so, you know, and, and I was trained to observe. So, you know, and, and I've built this, uh, my way of style of approaching people is through eye contact and body language. So again, um, I had my camera, uh, this was in a cell and I just bring my camera up. This guy in front of me didn't say a word at all. And uh, when I look at him, it was like, whoa, you know, my, my heart was beating really fast because, um, you know, he didn't look friendly at all. And, uh, but when he did that, no reaction. So I did, came to my distance, took a shot, then I did my fine tuning. I say fine tuning, that's when I fine tune my framing. And I going closer, took a shot, second shot, third shot, I got it, I walk away. So sometimes uh, you got to know when to take and when to stop. A lot of people, sometimes they go in a blast mode or motor drive mode, they shoot like crazy. And of course people get, get annoyed. So again, you know, you need to respect uh, your subject, the people that you photograph. So, so, you know, and then people can feel it as well, you know, but you shoot them like a machine gun, then they must be thinking, what on earth is he doing? Or what on earth is she doing? So again, it's understanding your equipment. The more you know your equipment, the better it is. Uh, so, yep. Yeah. So, you know, I got this shot and um, many people don't know the story behind this photo. They think it's like a record, record album or a CD album, you know, some rap music. And talking about sports, yeah, I mean, um, I know many, many people have saying, uh, you know, M system, like M system, you can't shoot sports, you know. Uh, it's not true. Of course you can. It's not meant for sports. Of course, you cannot shoot football, you know, but uh, you can shoot fast moving sub subject, object. So I did this when I was in um, Namibia. So I was with the BMW on the X5s. So um, I just asked BMW how much access I have. And I was told that you have all access, you can do whatever you want. So to me, great, you know? So whenever you do a photo or assignment, you need to find out how much access you have. Because I like to carry only what's needed. I don't like to carry too many equipment. Because I've done that before and it just ties you down, it makes you tired, it slows you down, 
you know, and then you got to keep track of your, you know, you got to keep track of your equipment, make sure it's safe. So I just took whatever needed for it. So this was taken on a, on a 35 millimeter uh, 1.4 lens and shot on the, the MP240. Yeah, so I was really close to, and uh, many people ask me, oh, what about the dust? You know, um, you know, of course you don't change your lens, you know, if you have such condition, you, you change your lens, then, then you're asking for trouble. Then you, you will get a lot of dots all over your, or your sensor. So yeah, I didn't change my lens for this. And this was taken in Singapore in Temple. And again, you know, um, what caught my eye, of course, was the, the monk. He was doing a, a prayer. And for me, what made, the fo what made this photo for me, of course, with all these people, people around it, and the table. This table, this line that leads me to him. So even if you're using a short lens, you can make it look close because of all these people around him. So it becomes like a geometric lines and becomes like a frame. So it's an illusion when I, you know, uh, it's an optical illusion, that's why I call it. You know, but without them, without these people around, I just took a photo of the monk then you look really small. So because of the, the geometric lines, the symmetrical lines that leads us to him, it looks big. So it's an illusion. So again, it's how you play with angles here. Um, going back to equipment, is how much you know equipment, how much you, you know, uh, how much reliability you rely on your camera. For me, I, uh, I've been shooting the, the amp system for 30 years. Um, I've got no issues, you know, I even shot this in the, in the rain. This was in uh, Tamanagara, I was on an assignment. Uh, we were on our way to, um, to the Orang, Orang Asli. And uh, it took us about five to six hours by boat to look for them. So, you know, Tamanagara is a tourist area but it's a big area, so the, the tourists will only go like, you know, like one kilometer, two kilometer, and you find, you know, Orang Asli staying there, those, those are meant for tourists. But my job was to look for the real Orang Asli living out in the, in the jungle. So it took us about five to six hours by boat, and uh, we had to walk, and then we, we will stay there for, for days, for weeks. And um, so we were caught in the heavy rain. So there was no, no shelter. So we had to stop halfway. And uh, so this man, the boatman, he was trying, what he was doing, he was uh, sort of taking the water out from the boat because you know, the water was filling the boat. So not, in order not to sink the boat. So again, with this camera, okay. Um, if you're using this camera, okay, the MP240 is splash proof. So you can shoot in the rain, yeah, but it's not waterproof, yeah. So you, of course you cannot use underwater. You use underwater and you kill your camera. The electronic component will die, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so when I use this, uh, I shot, shot in the rain. And good thing about this is the lens foot. So sometimes the lens foot, when the rain gets in, you don't get really wet on your lens. So that's why I'm still able to shoot it for so you just got to be careful when you start shooting. Of course, when you put your camera upwards, then of course, then all the water gets in, you get water droplet. But if you're shooting downwards, as you can see, I'm going slightly lower. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Are your equipments insured when you're on assignment? Um, yes and no, depends. Uh, when I was in Australia, uh, yes, my camera was is in, uh, insured. And sometimes I forget, you know, I forget to renew. And then I go out uh, for assignment and I shoot, then I realize, oh goodness, you know, it's not insured. So now I insure it, yes, yeah. Of course, it's better to get it insured than not get it insured, yes. 
Yes, I do get insured, but sometimes I you just overlooked. This was taken in, um, in Malaysia as well, in Kuantan, uh, in the fishing industry. And this was uh, shot in the early morning, uh, 4 a.m. in the morning. So the fishing vessel comes in and they start doing trading. Um, again, under this lighting, you know, at 4 in the morning, uh, you'll be thinking, oh, it's so difficult to shoot. Um, but um, I guarantee you with this, this camera, I can even shoot at one over 15th of a second. Uh, I can still get a sharp image provided my subject doesn't move. So, you know, and uh, with, with the ISO um, on this, I just bring it up about uh, 1600 ISO. And I shot this at about one over 90 of a second. And my F-stop is about F2, 2.8 in between that range. So again, you know, um, it's understanding your equipment. The more you know, the better it is. I was in uh, Pakistan. Uh, this, uh, again, this was in the 9-11 uh, crisis. So um, when 9-11 happened, uh, everybody went to New York. At that time, it was too late for me to go to New York. You know, it was like a week already and uh, everything was closed off in, uh, in New York. And I know I wouldn't be able to get access. And, uh, and the United States were, were throwing a lot, blaming on the, on, on the Taliban. And you know, there, were, there were a lot of signs, you know, that US is gonna bomb Kabul. So, uh, so I decided to take the next flight to Peshawar. To Pakistan, then going to Peshawar, Peshawar, then cross the border to Afghanistan. So at that time, it was under the Taliban. There's no way a foreigner could go into Afghanistan. So you have to cross the border. So this was along the way. So you can see, you know, um, I mean, this is not an everyday life that we see, like you know, in in town or in Orchard Road or you know. This is, is in, in, in the middle of nowhere. Trading is taking place everywhere. Uh, and this is one of the street scene in um, Peshawar going to, uh, along to the Khyber Pass into Afghanistan. Uh, this was um, the day when US bombed Kabul. So when U.S. bombed Kabul, um, they had a big protest. So they had a big protest. They um, started burning the U.S. flag. Um, they were a bunch of foreign correspondent, I would say, you know, I can count them, you know, maybe about 50 of us foreign correspondents. And the rest was local um, journalists and, and photographers. And, so what they did, you know, they, they invited us to photograph them. And then they got angry and then they start, started throwing rocks at us. So at that moment of time it was very, um, very hostile, uh, very unpredictable. Um, so that's when I travel, you know, that's when I, I, I like traveling, traveling light because I can move around. Uh, it's easy for me to, to you know, take, take my camera and run around, you know, with, without a long lens. So that's what I did. This is the, um, all the um, Afghans, the Afghanis. They walk from Kabul to Pakistan. So again, how I got this picture, um, you know, in, in, in Pakistan and in Afghanistan, you know, the woman, uh, men are not a lot supposed to take pictures of women, especially when they cover in broker. Uh, so this was a challenge for me because, you know, uh, to me, this was like, 
this photo is a storytelling photo of you know what they went through. So what I did here, yeah, I just walked past as they were squatting down and they were sitting down. Just as I walk, again, I emphasize here, yeah, knowing your equipment, yeah, the more you know equipment, the better it is. So what I did, I just know my distance, but I, I don't pre-focus. I like to focus on the spot. So what I tend to do sometimes, I get my estimate distance. And when I get close, that's when I fine tune my focusing. So what I did, I walked past. To look, this lady in the middle, she just, she looked at me. I know she's looking at me, although I cannot see her eyes. So what I did, I walk and I just squat down and took a shot. And uh, that's how I read body language. So I took a couple of shots, meaning about again, four frames, five frames. And I move on. And of course, you know, and 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 the woman uh, station in one corner, and the men are stationed in another corner. It's not like in the Western world, you know, men and women they're together. You know, so in in Pakistan, Afghanistan, women are side, women are on side, and I start talking to them, you know, and that's when they told me that. Uh, it took them two weeks to walk from Kabul to Pakistan to enter to Peshawar. Uh, this photo, again, um, this photo as well um, caught my eye. I was taking a photo of mother and child uh, behind me. So, you know, so there were camps all around here. And in front of me, there were camps as well. So, so as I was walking around here, uh, I saw a mother and daughter. So I took photos of them. And just as I was doing that, this boy walked past me. Again, um, good thing about this, when I frame, I, I don't go straight on like that. I go in between the, of a gap. So when I go have a bit of a gap, I can see what's around me. So when I can see what's around me, that's when this boy caught my eye. The boy just walked past me, and from my side eye, I shoot both eyes here, left and right. So you know, and and I saw that boy sort of. He was curious. I was trying, you know, he was wondering what what I was doing, and he was just doing that and looking at me. I was like. Wow, this is a picture. This is a picture that, that makes a story of the, the struggle of the, the Afghanis, you know? So the boy represents the Afghan people. That's how I, 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 I interpret my photos. So I turned around, took about, again, four to five shots. This was the first photo I took. Second photo, he turned his head slightly. Third photo, he sort of moved sideways a bit. Fourth picture, he walked away. So, yeah. And this was shot on film. This was shot on, 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 on my M6. So at that time, there's no time, you know, digital, you don't, you don't have, you can't even view. So when you're doing such things, you don't even view your photo. Uh, this is during the protests. Um, at that time, you know, um, Osama bin Laden was very popular. Everybody loved him, you know. Uh, there was strong support in Pakistan and uh, of course in Afghanistan as well. So, um, so this was the day when they had a big protest. And um, I just pre-focus and, you know, bring my camera up and just shot sideways. So it just get a bit of motion blur. Yeah. And of course this picture, uh, all the boys, you know, they were out there to protest as well. And I was really close with them. So I was work, working very, very close within like uh, less than a meter, 0 0.7 meter. So that's the closest I can go on, on this camera. The minimum focusing range is, minimum focusing range is 0 0.7 meter. So that's how close I went. So I like to, I use the word intimacy here. Uh, 
to be close to my subject uh, personal you know, so that uh, my viewer can feel it as well so um, so the photo is is not for myself is for for the people out there for for the audience in order to do that you need to get the strongest image um, to get the message out But I, someone asked, when yeah. I see photos of places like Afghan and India, I am reminded of Steve McCurry. What do you define as your style that sets your pictures apart from someone like Steve? Um, of course, I wouldn't like to associate myself with Steve McCurry. You know, Steve McCurry has got a different way of approach. Uh, I work with different, many photographers. I even worked with James Natchwe, uh, one of the most famous war photographers in, in the world. Uh, I consider my my photography as um, my style of photography is I would say I have no style. I shoot whatever catches my eyes, and every time when I'm on an assignment, I will look for a higher level of my to go beyond my abilities. So when I when I say that I want to I want to get my 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 photo like how you see in the movie. That, that it can move you. You know, certain movies, when you look at it, it just moves you. But those are motion. But when you shoot on still, you can't make your photo move. So how, how do you do that? So for me, that's my challenge to myself, to go beyond my abilities. So, uh, so at this point of time, I would say, you know, I wouldn't define myself as any style. I shoot the way how I see it at that point of time. So I got no set rules. I break the rules. I follow the guidelines, but I always break the rules. So if you don't break the rules, I guarantee you, your photos will always look the same. So, you know, so the thing is in photography, in creativity, there are no rules, you know? The thing is that, yes, you follow the rules, but you break the rules and that's when you start to build your own style. But you keep following the same rules all the time, your photos will become monotonous. So as you, I, I'm sure, you know, you've seen a few photographers, their work, when you look at it, you know, you know, ah, it's the same, it's the same, it's the same style. See, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah. Another question. Uh, how do you know when, it, when is the right time to go to these places or countries? Okay, uh, I do my research. Um, for this instance, this was during the, the, the September 11th crisis. Uh, so in the whole world were, you know, they were crying out, you know, uh, you know, what a disaster, you know, people were angry, people were sad, you know, so many people died. But on the other end of the world in Afghanistan and in Pakistan, they were celebrating. You know, so, uh, so, so, you know, when news broke on that, I was like, no, I have to, I have to document this because, you know, uh, um, the world has to see it, not because it's good or bad, because this is facts. So as, as, as a photographer or as, as a photojournalist, you photograph facts. You don't manipulate it. You know, so whatever is whatever is shot, you shot as the way it is. So you know, and 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 tell people, you know, because different people has got different mindset, different thinking. So at, at that point, at that point of time, to them they might be right. They think it's the right thing to do, but maybe perhaps in you know, five years or ten years later, it's like, oh, it's not the right thing. So you know, so 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 photos do make an impact. So, so I go in, I do my research. So uh, like, for instance, shamanism, I do projects on shaman. Uh, there's no right time or wrong or, or not the right time. I went in because um, uh, it's, it's a dying, uh, I wouldn't say trade, it's a dying practice. So, so I, want to, I want to document before it's, it's, it's gone. You know, but I don't think it will go, it'll be gone uh, that soon. But 
you know, just less and less people uh, uh, practicing shamanism. This was in Hong Kong. Um, this was shot, taken last year uh, during the um, protests. And um, this was in Poly U, whereby the police came in and uh, they started firing tear gas. And this is a shot where I got shot as well by a rubber bullet. But uh, in the midst of taking photos like that, sometimes you get shot, you know, uh, you don't feel it. You feel the pain, but uh, in, in the midst of, you know, the adrenaline in you and surviving mode, you know, you need to survive, you know, make sure you don't get hit again. Uh, so you just push that emotion or that pain away. So, um, so this guy, you know, I saw this photo. And I took a shot and, and I got shot because, you know, again, uh, no matter how careful you are, uh, you still get shot sometimes. Yeah. This is Hong Kong again. This was a peaceful demonstration. The office workers came out and protest. Uh, so again, um, Angle-wise is very important for me. I want to show the strongest impact of what they were trying to show. They're showing up with the five rules. So this has got a meaning for it when they put their hands up. Yeah, five rules, not one less. You know, they got the five rules that they, they, they implement to the government. Uh, this was taken um, in Hong Kong, in Hong Kong during the riot. Uh, this was um, taken about one in the morning. So again, um, to me, photography, there's no time frame. You shoot all times of the day or night. So um, my equipment helps me a lot, you know, my camera, because of my, I'm using a, a 1.4. So that helps me to shoot at wide open. And, um, and, you know, it's small, it's robust, and I know what the optics can do. So again, uh, I emphasize is knowing your equipment. So the more you know your camera, your lenses, the character of your, 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 your equipment, what it can do, when I say character, in, in, in terms of at what eye, so the maximum you can, you can push before it starts to starts to break, you know, starts to, starts to have bending or, you know, or the picture is, is, is not usable. So you need to know at what limitation. This was taken in India. Uh, I was covering on drug, drug problem worldwide on uh, heroin. And this was in India in the de detox center. So uh, all this, they were, they were high. So, you know, as you can see, they were holding their hands all together. So they were pretty, they were not stable at all. They were pretty shaking all the way. They were shaking all the time. So that's why they're sort of trying to support each other. And of course, um, you know, to make a nice picture, you know, um, this guy just happened to walk in my way and this guy just happened to light. And to me, it's like, you know, that makes the element, all that makes a photo for me. And this was shot in film. Uh, so in those days, shooting film, you know, you 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 can't view like digital, you know, whether you got it or not. So again, it's, it's understanding your equipment, understanding your film, how much you can push your film. So for all those of you who who use film, I would just like to to sort of um, bring this up. Um, how I got this photo? This was this was push push process. So, uh, you know, if, if you never use film, then you might not be able, you might not understand what I'm trying to say. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, was shot at ISO 400, I push at 6400 uh, ISO. So what I did, you know, my processing time was like seven minutes on a normal 
processing time, say if I shot on 400, uh, what I did, I pushed to 20 minutes. So which means I push my processing. It's like overcooking it. And that's how I get my image out. So because unlike today in, digi in digital world, um, you know, I can change my eyes so as and when, you know, 400, I'm go to these dark areas. Ah, it's okay. I can use, I can use eyes. So, you know, uh, 3002, you know, but on film days, you can't do it. So that's how you, you, you need to work around and know what you're doing. This was taken in, uh, in Brisbane, uh, did this, um, um, project on drought with a friend. Uh, uh, she took me into a family's farm, Catherine. So, uh, and then we, we went to this place as well. Uh, they had this festival for farmers. Uh, I can't remember what it called. So again, um, it was pretty dry because of the drought and the sun rays coming in because of the dust. So, So that's how, how dry it was, but thank goodness it rained. So now I, I, I heard that this, this place uh, is full of grass. It's not like this anymore. This was taken in Cambodia. I did this on, uh, this is a project on um, human trafficking and child prostitution. So, um, I was assigned to do this for an NGO. And unfortunately, they, they didn't have any more budget. So um, the project was uh, called off. But I'm still doing it on my own, but it's a very slow process uh, due to funding. So uh, I did this and this was shot in Phnom Penh. And sex workers, uh, Slowly, they, they accepted me and uh, they invited me to the, um, it's, like a, it's like a hair saloon. It's just a, a one room saloon. So these men rent it out and all these girls will go there and do their makeup. So uh, just before, before they, they started you know, working. So when, when, when they don't have customers, they, they are like, little teenagers laughing and giggling and running around. But the minute the cust a customer comes, their, their, their mood and their, the way they behave is totally different. So I saw that the huge difference and all. So, um, so my job was um, trying to, to get the work out as much as possible and let the world know about uh, child prostitution. There's a lot of... Uh, pedophile cases in Cambodia. It's a safe haven for people having uh, uh, underage sex, uh, you know, either with a, a, a male or a female. So just to um, let you all know that um, having sex with an underage person is an international crime. So, uh, so in Cambodia, you know, they had the, the they had um, uh, Australian Federal Police, uh, they had the FBI, Scotland Yard, you know, they're all there um, eye, eyeing on, on, on people, um, targeting on, on child prostitution. So. Matthias, I just need to stop you for a bit. Uh, yep. Dr. Chua asked, what was the closest shave to danger you experienced? Does that deter you from taking the same risk? Sorry, say again, what was? What was the closest shave to danger you experienced? The closest shave? Yep. Uh, when I was in Iraq, uh, I almost got killed twice, deliberately. Um, I was in Basra and I was taking pictures. Uh, Baghdad to Bas Basra is a big, huge difference because in Baghdad, you know, you, f you see a lot of fighting, a lot of killing. In Basra is south of uh, of Iraq. Um, it's not there's not, not so much violence there, you know, but they're still having war there. You know, and when I was there, and you know, I was like 
you know, after coming from, from Baghdad to Basra, I was like, wow, what a huge difference, you know. At least for once, I don't hear fighting. And uh, in the morning, I, I was with my correspondent, Iraqi correspondent. He, um, he went to the market and life goes on out there. You know, people still need to, to eat in the go to the market. So I took photos. And two guys came up to me and... Um, one guy came, shook my hand, and he greeted me as Salam Alaikum, and I, I, I replied, said Malikum Salam. You know. And a guy behind me, I, I didn't see him. I saw two guys, but he was behind me, and the front guy, and uh, they had a few people about, you know, about two meters away, and my correspondent was there. And the front guy was telling, speaking Arabic to the guy in behind, it's like, what are you waiting for? Shoot him. And of course, I didn't under, fully understand Arabic, so you know, uh, I didn't show any sign of panic. But my correspondent was like, you know, he was really nervous. And just as he said that, British troops, you know, they were on patrol. And the guy told him, said, I can't shoot him. Look, British army, you know, and, uh, and they walk away. So when they walk away and um, I was like, okay, you know, I, I started taking pictures and my correspondent told me, he said, we have to go. And he told me quietly because, you know, everybody heard, everybody knew. And I was like, no, 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 no. We need to get the photos out. We need, to, I need to send this out, you know. And then his tone changed and he said, Matthias, we have to go now. And he said that I knew something was wrong. So I walked and he told me, so those two guys there, I said, yeah, they're okay. He said, no, they almost shot you. So that was a close shave, yeah, that's one. So, and, uh, and the close call was, um, we almost got shot by RPG, rocket propelled grenade. That's one of it. And, um, and, and it's not in this picture, I didn't, I am not sh I didn't show it. Uh, it was in a vehicle, we were shot by sniper. So he hit the he hit the windshield, the, the windshield crack, and um, and missed us. Yeah. If the if the, if the windshield went through, then I would have been dead. I mean, I got lots of stories to say. You know, I mean, to tell, I'm I'm like a cat. You know, I, I even almost got killed in in Papua New Guinea. I fell into while well, covering the um, the um, tribal. The, uh, the, the peacemaking of uh, the tribes having war in Mendy. And uh, we were driving halfway and I, um, I told the driver, his name was Raymond. I said, Raymond, uh, I need to take a pee, man. I gotta stop, you know, is that toilet? I said, anyway, it's toilet, you know. So anyway, we stopped and we walked to the bush and um, he's a big guy. So he walks, his steps pretty big. So I just did small steps and um, guess what? I fell into a trench, a, a, a trap. So in between the trap is, is like uh, six, six feet deep and it had poles all in between. I fell in between the pole. So, uh, so when I fell and I, I, I shouted, hey Raymond, and the guy said, where are you? I said, I'm here, you know? So when he, he saw me, he's got a shock. It's like, you know, but I didn't even think of it, you know, because to me it was like, get me out of here, you know. So he got a stick, you know, and, and pulled me out. And uh, had a pee, and we drove. And he's, uh, his face was so pale. I said, what's wrong with you? You know, he's look as though he saw a ghost. And he looked at me, it's like, he almost got killed, do you know that? Of course, it didn't click to my mind, you know. It's like, yeah, uh, yes, but, uh, I'm alive, you know, but see, it usually dawn on me by the end of the day, then I get really burned out. Yeah. So that's one of it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a tough, uh, to be a photojournalist, but, um, you know, nobody forced me to, to do, to do this sort of job. Uh, this is what I, I, um, I love doing because I love humanity. And uh, like I, I, I mentioned earlier, the photos are, are not meant for me. 
although you know I um, I can see things beyond, but to me the photos are are for the people. Yeah. And uh, this shot in uh, in in the airport. This is during the COVID nineteen crisis. So this is in Singapore. You know all the. Uh, airspace was shutting down so i went to the airport and um, of course you know a few airlines are still flying so again it's it's not planned you just walk i walked through you know it's all through observation and uh, i saw this pilot just walked in just one pilot i'm sure there are more pilots you know uh, usually they have the pilot the co-pilot so um so i just walked in and i took the photo uh, you didn't even, I didn't even sort of no time to, to frame or, or get exposure or whatever. I just focus immediately and then get my, my exposure right and take a shot. Yeah. This was taken in uh, Indonesia. This is uh, Mantawai, the Mantawai tribes, you know. So I did this with, uh, with a medical doctor on uh, water testing. So in this area whereby there, there's no no electricity, uh, no power point, uh, sorry, no electricity, no water supply, uh, no internet access as well, and no, no, there's no data, your phone cannot be contactable at all. So we stayed with them, and uh, what I did, I carried lots of batteries. Uh, traveling was, uh, was tedious because we had to fly from island to island, and then from, from the island, then we had to, go by road. When you say road, you know, it's not a good road. It's all muddy, dirt road, you know, and, and, and you're not riding on, you're not, they don't give you a, a, a dirt bike, you know, a scrambler. Mm. They give you a small, uh, like a Honda Cup, you know, small motorbike. So, uh, so it was tough. It was, <laughs> it was really tough, you know, so I, I hit my camera so many times because I don't carry it back. So I, I sling my, my camera sort of uh, around my, my neck like that and then uh, every time I hit a bump my camera will swing and keep hitting the handlebar so every time I hit the handlebar I would keep telling myself oh, oh, I, I broke my lens you know but uh, thankfully they always hit my lens hood so it supports See, without a lens hood I think I've broken my lens by now yeah. so Mantawai tribes yeah and 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 this this monkey skull yeah so there's a story behind this here. Yeah. Why do you hang this? Because to them it's like a trophy, you know. Um, and this is the man of the house. So he will hunt for a monkey. It's not. It's not. It's not the. the it's not all the time they eat monkeys, because uh, uh, it's not easy to hunt. You know, uh, people will be saying, "Oh, it's so easy to hunt." You know. So, so when when he gets a monkey, you know, he feeds the family. But as as he as a person that hunt the monkey. He's not allowed to eat a monkey because in, he, in their beliefs, if he hunts a monkey, if he, is, he, if, he, if he ate the monkey, then something mishap or something bad will happen to him. If that's their belief. Yeah. And that's from Indonesia Mentawai tribe and this is going to Siberia. So this is in Siberia, this is on the shamanism on shaman. So uh, again, to photograph shaman, uh, it's not easy. You have to be accepted. Uh, you have to be welcomed by them. So again, I was fortunate. I, I met this, this man, this shaman by chance. And uh, I was actually uh, taking photos of another shaman and he was assisting the other shaman. And when the, the, the ritual, ritual rites, everything was finished, and he came towards me and my Russian guide, and he invited us uh, whether we'd be interested to, um, to, to witness a three-day ritual. And of course, I will not say no, you know, because I've been looking for them when I went to Siberia, my main, my main objective was to look for them. So um, again, under low light, uh, I didn't even carry a flash. I hardly use flash. And also I, um, I solely just depend on, 
on a fast lens and a small camera on, on, on my, my M system. This was in Iraq. So this is a place where by all the um, abandoned war vehicle. So they dump all this place in this place. So this is one of the most dangerous area. To go to this place, you got to be careful because at that time during the war, all the Saddam army, they go there and hide out. It's the hiding place. So this is a place I almost got shot as well, but uh, it was a friendly fire. When I say friendly fire, I, um, I walk around um, and they're always in hiding. And as I was walking and this guy just came out and pulled out a pistol. And this time I thought, uh, I think I'd be gone this time. You know, I think I, my time's up. Yeah. And what he did, right, in Iraq, yeah, they fire in mid air, they have three, three reasons here. Yeah. One, uh, a celebration, could be a birthday, wedding. Uh, two, uh, a death, someone died. Three, they just happy trigger. So uh, when he saw me, he was happy to see a foreigner. So he started firing in mid air. So, you know, I, um, that's when I, I thought, you know, my time's up. And then my correspondent came, he was quick, uh, talked to them, and um, they invited us to have tea. So when we had tea, and I had two cameras at that time with me. So one here and one slightly lower, two cameras. And uh, they, they started pouring tea and then they had tea and then and, and, and a saucer. And it's also at tea as well. And um, they were talking in Arabic, I didn't understand, you know, I just, you know, just just listen. And and the guy with the gun, he just pointed at me, it's like, drink, drink, you know, he's pointing the gun at me, asking me to drink. And of course, you know, in, in situations like that, you have to play, you have to be calm. You know, you mustn't, sh you mustn't show sign of nervous, you know. Uh, you gotta keep your cool. So what I did, I said, yeah, yeah, no worries, you know, I'll drink, you know. So I, I had the, the cup, cup, and pre assuming this is a saucer filled with tea. And what I did, I just went like that. And all the tea started dropping on my camera, spilled on my camera. And then he was pointing, he was shouting. He's like, tea spilling, and he was pointing the gun. I said, no, no, no. Then my correspondent told me, Matthias, Tea all over you. Then I could feel, you know, oh, oh, it's bloody hot, you know. Then that's when I realized my, my camera was soaked with tea. So my camera had tea as well. So, um, but it still worked. So it's a workhorse. Yeah. So. Matthias, were you ever afraid when you had to go to certain places? Uh, if I tell you I'm not, I'm lying. Yes, of course. Um, I, I am afraid because I, 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 I can't see what is expected of the unknown. So a lot of times um, I follow my hunch. You know? uh, there are many times I, I took risks, you know, but at times I, I felt that no, it's, not, it's not the right time. You know, uh, when I was in Iraq during the war, you know, I met a lot of, um, a lot of groups. And it, they, they even invited me, like saying, look, you know, we can help you out. We can show you how we work. You know, they were against the U.S., you know, they, they were fighting. So these are all the smaller fundamentalist groups. And on the day when I turned up, uh, I just looked at the surrounding. I felt, no, uh, if I went in, I would be kidnapped. So, of course, I am afraid. Uh, if I tell you I'm not, I'm lying to you. Uh, but... Um, a lot of times you got to you got to be you got to show that that you got to be self confident if you show you're afraid then then of course they they can read people can read you know so if you show that you're self confident uh, you know what you're doing um, you just got to be careful yeah this was taken in uh, in Baghdad this was before the war. So before the war, you know, you, you get heavy presence of the police and army. So I was there before and during the war. 
So I had I had two different assignments. So during the before the war, you know, I um, I went around. I uh, it was a different situation during and after because during the war, um, when you go into Baghdad, you uh, you have a minder, an Iraqi Iraqi minder. So the minder will will guide you. Wherever you go, he will escort you. The whole idea is to slow you down. Because like for instance, like you tell the minder, hey, look, I want to go to the hospital. You know, I want to take photos. You know, we need to take pictures of us, you know, of patients. And he will tell you, ah, oh, no, you got to write. You need to get permission, da, 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 and so on. So it slows you down. Yeah. And during the war, of course, you know, there's no rules. You know, all hell breaks loose. So you can, you could have gone anywhere you want. But uh, again, um, I did my study, you know, when I was um, uh, doing the war, you know, I, I realized, uh, I found out that um, by right, as, as, an, as a foreigner, you need to have minders with you all the time. But um, half of the population don't even know that a foreigner uh, has to have a minder. So what I did, right, I went on my own. And that's how I got my photos. Yeah. This we were caught in the uh, in the crossfire. So it's not meant to be in this place. We were meant to go to another place. So during the war, it's always uh, it's very unpredictable. You know, you really don't know what's happening. You know, uh, uh, while you're driving, you know, halfway, and then you you hear gunshots, and and you know, then you hear troops are running around. That's when you stop. You know, you take cover. So, um, so this was in the midst of uh, fighting. We were looking for snipers, and um, as you can see, I went really low. You know, uh, um, I was literally on the ground because you know there was a lot of firing going on. Now this is the extreme, yeah. I mean, from war, and now this is to a club. You know, so this is a, one of the projects I'm doing. It's called Love and Last. So this is in a club in Berlin. So, uh, so again, uh, I shoot in all lighting conditions, regardless whether it's day or night. And um, this is uh, in uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, this is when, you know, a lot of uh, the Chinese students I uh, don't know whether to use the word evacuate or they were going back. Uh, all I know, they were going back to China. Uh, so it, they were in the panic stage because a lot of flights, uh, were, were, they were cutting down on flights. And um, this lady, you know, um, at that time, even to get a face mask, it was so difficult. So what she did when I saw this photo, when I saw this person, you know, uh, she was, you know, she wore a shower cap uh, that's a raincoat, you know, uh, hoping that this would prevent her from contracting uh, the virus. And she even has, she's even got a plastic glove here. So they improvised whatever they could. So yeah, I took a photo of that before all flights uh, um, stopped flying. So I think that is my. Uh, Last photo, yes, and thank you very much. If you have any questions, please feel free uh, to ask, regardless of whether it's technical or experience, uh, anything. Okay, uh, so Henry asked, uh, photojournalism captures a fair share of pain and suffering. What do you do to restore your balance and sanity? Um, I'm very fortunate you know, I mean, I know a lot of my colleagues here, they suffer from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I always turn negative to positive. I do meditation, that helps me. Um, and I look at photos, you know, I know people say that you know, photos are sad, drastic, whatnot, but, to me, uh, I see this light there. There's light, you know, to, 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 to help people, to help them in a sense that um, 
if there's no one to record it, then then these people, there's no there's no story to be told about them. You know, uh, and what really drives me, what really keeps me going, I've helped a few people. I'm not saying that I can solve the world crisis, but um, typically one example, I um, I took photos of the students. Um, they were fighting against the military junta in Myanmar. So I went in and uh, across the border, I took photos of them. And the only students they were fighting against, you know, uh, against human rights, you know, they've been abused. And years later, you know, we kept in touch and uh, he got asylum to go to Canada. And of course, for them, you know, uh, they've been under political asylum. They've got no papers at all. When I say no papers, right, when they leave the country, they, they, they left everything, practically nothing. So in order to, to be accepted by a, a new country, they need evidence that, that, you know, okay, although you don't have any paper to show that, you know, your status or whatever, but we need to, we need to see something, what you did. So I took photos of him and um, my photos helped him to, to get to, to found a new home. So he found a new home. So Canada is his new home. So because of my picture that I took of him uh, under the political struggle, uh, he got asylum. So, you know, so things like that. And, uh, and of course, you know, and, uh, and when I do such work, um, in return, I do shows. So when I do shows, I raise money and I raise money and I'll, I will give to a particular NGO that, that, uh, that I find that is most uh, suitable for, for that situation. So I find that um, such photos, you know, is, is not, I know it's sad and tragic, but I see this light, there's a light there. I see positive in it. Ricky, so Ricky asked also, uh, during this period, are you taking this opportunity to plan for your next project? Yes, uh, I am. Um, I'm still working on shamanism. So I intend to, you know, fingers crossed, you know, hopefully, you know, the airspace starts to open and everything goes back to normal. Um, I will do more on shamanism. I would like to cover... Uh, in South Africa, South America, uh, the, the native Indians, you know, they call them the medicine men. Uh, I would like to cover on that because uh, that is, uh, I find it's pretty interesting. I like covering culture as well and, and, and uh, religious stuff. And of course, my, my project on love and loss, which I've not finished yet, so I'm still in the process of doing it. Uh, I get a lot of people asking me um, that they want to be part of the project of Love and Last, but uh, a lot of them are not in Singapore, they're overseas. So um, when I get the opportunity, yes, I will, I will do that. Have you encountered any difficulties or breakdowns of your equipment and either camera or lenses during your assignment? Uh, Mm, I had two encounters, not major. Um, and when I was using film, the way I, I, I shot, I wind pretty quick. I do double wind. So, excuse me. So when I wind so fast, I snap the counter spring, the counter, the spring counter. So when that snap, the counter doesn't work anymore. So you know, in those days when you shoot film, you should go one, two, three, and then till 36, you finished. Yeah, the counter. So that, that spring snapped. Other than that, it still works. You know, only thing I cannot see how many frames. But when you shoot film, it's only 36 exposure. So when you shoot 36 exposure, when you're done, you cannot whine anymore. So I know I'm, I'm, I'm done. That's one, two. Um, I wouldn't say it's a breakdown. Uh, I was shot in Japan during winter, um, I was minus 10, and this applies to all batteries. So when it's too cold, your battery just runs flat. 
you know so i i had uh, i cared about 10 batteries and uh, all fully charged and three batteries just went dead you know so uh, so I, it was a bit uh, a bit annoying because you know i was like i missed my shot but then uh, the fourth one it worked so you know so so things like, like this you learn from from what you can encounter so so when i go to a cold climate i tend to carry a hot pack you know those those little pack where i for your for your for your fingers or your hand or your feet yeah i just grab a towel and i just put uh, put that uh, around my battery and it should be okay mm. yeah <clears throat> so, okay so before everybody leaves right i just yeah. want to make an announcement so just for all of you ellen photo and Leica. Has a, we, we prepared a promotional bundle for all of you. Uh, so for any Leica M system that you purchase from us, you will get a free 256GB memory stick and a Leica ladder protector together with it. So if you're interested, please feel free to indicate your interest in the chat box below. Then uh, my colleagues from Allen Photo will reach out to you after this session. Yeah. So if there's any other questions, uh, please feel free to indicate it uh, in the chat box below. So, Mr. Ta so Tan asked, what is your favorite lens that you carry when you go for your assignment? Okay, my favorite lens is a 35, 35 millimeter 1.4. Um, the reason why I use that lens is because the lens is closest to the human eye, 35 and 50. Uh, because being a photojournalist, uh, uh, of course, I can use a wide angle lens. Uh, the good thing about a Leica lens, you get minimal distortion. So even if I use a wide angle lens, I get minimal, minimal distortion. But I like using a 35 because it's how I see from, from my human eye. And when I shoot a 35, it's how I, I get it. Uh, that's my favorite lens I use. My backup lens is a 24 and 50 millimeter. So that's what I use for. Ricky asked as well, uh, What's the widest lens? Uh, what's the widest angle lens you use for your M, and why? Okay, the widest I use is twenty-four. Um, I like to use the widest twenty-four. Is um, of course um, a lot of times I have excess. So when you have excess, uh, I don't need to use a wide angle lens. The reason why people use to me, my reason why I use a wide angle lens is when I don't have excess. When I say I don't have excess, I have limit limit space. Of covering my angles, yeah. So, so when I don't have, say, I'm using a 35, you know, it's too tight, you know, and I'm right in a very small room. So that's when I start using a wider lens. Yeah. So, so that's my reason why I use wide angle lens. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh... Typically, typically, the images are quite sad and depressing to, in, in some pictures. So, how do you think people can overcome and turn this into hope? Uh, well, they are reality pictures. They are not fake, they are real. Uh, I know we always see happy photos. Uh, to me, uh, even in such crisis like that, I see, I see hope there. I see people smile, people laugh. Uh, even when, when I was in a war in Iraq, you know, people still laugh, you know, in the midst of it. And um, hopefully this, all these photos um, can help people. When I say help, you know, uh, people can do something about it. You know, we live in this modern world. Sometimes we are caught up with our own world. Uh, I think, you know, we as human beings, um, we have to learn to help others because uh, we never know uh, one day we might need help because we always think yeah we we are in a safe country we are safe haven everything is good you know but you never know one day you might need help and this happened to me and I I I never knew when I was in Iraq you know I never knew that I needed help although you know I, I was in in a good position but uh, when I was in Iraq uh, everything was cash credit card is no, it's not valid at all. And uh, I was asked to leave the country. Uh, and, um, and I was asked to, they came out uh, just a law saying that every, every foreigner, 
had to pay 100 US dollars a day. And that was not stated when we came in. So, um, so I didn't have enough and I had to go and borrow money and, 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 and I missed my flight. You know, and I had only left like $25, you know, US dollars and to get back to where I wanted to go. You know, no one wanted to take me. They wanted like $100. And I, uh, I met a guy, he just happened to, go, happened to be in the airport and he took me to where I wanted to go. And um, I met an artist as well on, on just before the day I was, I was uh, asked to leave the country because they were getting rid of all foreign correspondents. So, and so I could not leave the country and I, I, I end up staying in his place and uh, I told him, look, I need to borrow money from you. When I return, I will pay you. He took a stack, this stick, and he gave me the money and I said, I'll pay you. And he told me, no, it's okay. It's only paper to me, you know, I never felt so, you know, I, that's when, you know, when I was, it was, when I was down and out, that's when I realized how is it like being penniless and I've got no money at all. I can relate how people sometimes they come, come up to me and say, look, I need your help. I've got no money at all. I need you to go to a certain place. The feeling I felt is how sometimes I encounter people that come asking for money. I felt the same. And that's when I realized, you know, uh, with all these photos, you know, hopefully, hopefully, you know, there will be more, more humane and more humanity in life that we can help people. So of course, meditation helps me. Music, I love music. Music is a sign of relief. So, um, and I always tell myself, never give up. Yeah because uh, we only live once and then you know we live once we make the best in our life if we don't and then you know we procrastinate and you know uh, then later down the track we might kick ourselves from behind and say i should have done it you know if you're passionate in what you do uh, go for it because uh, you know we only live once make your life make something valuable about your life and, and that's what, uh, that's what has taught me. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Matthias. So do you have any words of wisdom to all budding and young photographers or photojournalists? Um, yes. If you want to be a good photographer, a good photojournalist, perseverance, consistency, Okay, if you're not consistent, you will not get results. So it's gonna, it's a difficult out there, you know, just not in photos, in everything nowadays. So if what you wanna do, what you believe in, in doing, just keep doing it, you know, and be honest to yourself. When I say be honest to yourself, don't, don't give excuses for yourself. When I say don't give excuses for yourself, don't, um, of course, we need, we need to use Photoshop or Lightroom, but don't manipulate. Try to shoot as raw as possible. Even if you do mistakes, it doesn't matter. That's when you learn. We learn from mistakes. If you don't learn from mistakes, and you know, you never achieve anything. So my advice is, you know, keep shooting. Uh, stick to one lens first. Don't get caught up, you know, and say, I want to use this, I want to use that. You can use various lenses, but stick to one as your prime, as your primary primary lens, and work on it until you're good at it, until you understand light, you understand angles, then stop playing around. Yeah. But you know, you have to be honest with yourself. That's the most important thing. Because in today's day and age, everybody wants to get the shortcut of success in their photography. And by doing that, I'm not saying they're cheaters or whatever. Sometimes they use manipulation and whatnot. But you got to be honest yourself. If you're not honest yourself, then eventually you will eat up on you. So that's my advice. 
Thanks, Matthias. Okay, so for for those who are keen to do workshops or any critic sessions together, Matthias, you all can reach out to Matthias through his uh Instagram or or his website. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. You know, yeah, thanks for your time. Yeah. Thank you so much for such an insightful and educational sharing. Personally, I'm really intrigued by your journey as a photojournalist and to capture this moment. Yeah. So I hope everyone is as impressed as I am, as inspired as I am. Yeah. So if any other questions, uh, please feel free to leave in the chat box below.